Welcome to 1991 Movie Rewind, a podcast where we watch and review every movie released in 1991, from the all-time greatest classics to the critically panned and everything in between. We will rediscover forgotten fan favorites and uncover hidden gems as we explore the depths of direct video Join us in our celebration of the fun, unique, and diverse films of this highly underrated year. This week, we watch Delicatessen. <laughs> and thank you for joining us on 1991 Movie Rewind. Delicatessen takes place in a rundown apartment building in a post-apocalyptic world where grains have become currency and the meat from the downstairs butcher shop is a luxury experience. A new arrival to the complex, Louis Song, played by Dominique Pinon, throws off the delicate balance of their ecosystem and now the tenants want to put him on the chopping block. Screenplay by Jean-Pierre Junet, Marc Caro, and Gilles Adrian, Directed by Marc Caro and Jean-Pierre Junet, and released in France on April 17th, 1991. Have you seen Delicatessen before? Yes, I have. I did as well, a long time ago. Did not remember much of it. Same here, but <laughs> I watched this like 20 years ago when I had French class in college. And as like an extra credit, I guess, we, we were told we can watch like French movies after class. And I was like, okay. And it was this one and City of Lost Children. Did you have to write reports on no, them? No, we or just you watched just, it. You just stay and watch. <laughs> we just stayed and watch. And I was like, yeah, I like movies. I'll watch a French movie. Yeah. And yeah, I kind of got these two confused. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. Um, they're very similar in tone. I don't remember much about City of Lost Children at all either. But, I mean, in terms of, like, color palette, they're going to be very same. Yeah, and then, you know, the th directing they have, style. like, the same people in it. And then I remember, mm -hmm. like, the water, because I know Yeah, there's Dominique. underground elements to both. Yeah, yeah, Dominique Pinon, he's, like, a diver. And then that's all I really remember was, like, him underwater. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I probably watched both of these around the same time as well. Maybe a little bit earlier. I don't know. Um, when I worked at the video store, you know, that's when I tried to explore as much as I possibly could. And so, yeah, I was like trying to go for the foreign films that I knew had some sort of pedigree or, you know, cult status behind them. And so I went after those and mm -hmm. watched them um, and didn't remember much after words other than yeah it's quirky and interesting but I, you know it didn't grab my attention the way that like let's say Amelie did you know right I mean ago, I like when ago. I watched them I was like these movies are amazing <laughs> when I watched it after uh like when I was in college I was like oh and it's like the only French movies I remember watching growing up was like La Femme Nikita or something mm -hmm. and that was like it yeah I mean, that makes sense. People our age don't typically, or, you know, <laughs> what our age would have been at that time don't typically yeah, get I to was, see er, a whole lot of er, foreign movies. I was movies. like early 20s, and yeah. I was starting to finally watch other m movies. Broadening and your like, Yeah, I was broadening my horizons. Or in the like, late teens, early 20s is when I was like, okay, I'm going to start watching like independent movies or foreign movies. Yeah, and this is one of them. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it, it's very quirky, sometimes quirky for quirkiness sake. Um, I don't know if that's a bad thing. Uh, it can be effective at times, but uh, overall in this movie, I don't know. I mean, what, what was your perception coming back to it? I mean, I, I really like this movie. Like, a lot. It's uh, It just brought me back to... I was like, oh, okay. Like, I mean, I like the director, and I like the majority of his movies. His sense of I've humor. I've seen tons. Yeah, I, I've only seen, like, three, I guess, overall. Oh, no, I guess I have seen a very long engagement as well. Yeah, but... I, I've, seen, I've seen four 
of his movies, <laughs> and yeah. I like them all. <laughs> the, the one I don't think I've seen is Alien Resurrection. No, yeah, but that's a different thing altogether. <laughs> yeah, it's not like his movie. Yeah, it's not same, his same like uh, it's realm. like a black like these black comedies. Like it's dark humor. I like. Yeah, I I wanted more substance and world building in this. So I mean, obviously there's a a cast of quirky characters and interesting things that are going on, and visually it's very dynamic and stunning and. Um, rhythmically it's that way too but I didn't get immersed in the world because I didn't fully know what was happening in this world um, you know I mentioned in the summary that it's a post-apocalyptic I pretty much only know that from reading other people's descriptions you know like the summaries that are like part of you know the press materials and also there's maybe like halfway through when that postman comes in for the first time He's talking about um, some of the horrors that lie outside the building. You know, talking about like this yeah, war with going the vermin in, and stuff like that. Yeah, it's going on in the city. Uh, yeah. I'm assuming that that's Paris. Like, it's worse out in the city than wherever they are. But I mean, They're kind of like in the middle of nowhere. Because it's like only their building and then really nothing else. That's that's the impression that we get. Um but it could easily have just taken place in that building without the post-apocalyptic thing and been basically the exact same story, almost. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I wish I would have had a little bit more background as to what the apocalypse was. Who are they fighting? Is it just these troglodyte people who are in the sewers that's yeah, like against I, the regular I'm just, people? I don't know. I'm thinking happening? that it's just like the end of the world and you know kind of like climate change you know there's like no i mean there's like no livestock anymore there's like not even grass it's just like dirt and air <laughs> maybe I mean, but uh, that's what i was us, like right? get, i mean and then it's very hard for them to get any sort of food even though the troglodyte people they're like the vegetarians and even um, Louis Song, he was like, I don't eat meat. But it's like the only non-meat things to eat is either like the beans or corn. And it's like, there's no other produce to be eaten. Yeah, I mean, some of that because is... Because it's probably too hard to grow. Because I think, I mean, water obviously exists, but it's like, sure. maybe it's hard to keep the crops growing i don't know <laughs> I, I, I really don't know and, and that's it's... i i was just assuming it's like almost the end of the world because of like climate change it, it, it could be like there was a war and you know i mean yeah they talk about a war and vermin and stuff but I, I i don't know to the extent of how things are because you know um there's the the, the tapioca family uh -huh. right and he doesn't have a job, and he's expected to get one so he can have money or grains or whatever to trade for yeah. whatever. So, I mean, there's obviously some commerce going on. There's obviously some bartering that's going on. There's obviously jobs that need to take place other places than in the building that are happening, mm -hmm. right? So, because when um, Louis Song comes in, he is the handyman around the building yeah why couldn't that have just been mr tapioca because he didn't have a job he needed to work he could have done that unless that role is specifically for people to sacrifice for meat that's what i assumed yeah so i mean the fact that we have to kind of put these things together ourselves is well, a they little don't, bit of a detriment I think that, yeah, the more you learn, you're like, these people that live in that apartment, they're safe. They will not get eaten. So it just kind of... But we don't know why. We don't know, like, how far I think maybe the, the butcher guy was like, I'll, I'll make you a deal. I'm not going to kill any of you, you people... And you can live in my building, but you still have to pay rent somehow. 
yeah, there's still, yeah, there's still agreements that basically, you know, there's rules in the building which are not fully outlined, but basically if the rules are not followed, then people have to be sacrificed, or if you can't pay, then you have to sacrifice a family member, and they're going to get cut right. off the meat to give to the other residents, but we don't, we don't know all those rules. It's not like we need to have a list. We don't need to have, you know, somebody go through them one by one in a narration or anything, but, um... I just would have liked to know more about the outside world that would cause that situation to be taking place in this building. I yeah, I just assumed it's a post-apocalyptic world like this. I yeah, mean, I just want to know more about the apocalypse and what else is like happening what outside caused the building. These people to live this way, right? This yeah. Why I mean, did some of them retreat into the sewers, and why did some of them just hole up in a building? Obviously, there's still people like the postman and the cab driver who are freely moving around. Right. Um, there, there may be some sort of commerce that's happening as well because you know those two tenants of the building are making those little cow sound toys. Yeah, they're making toys and like that's their job. So for is there really children? a market for that in a post-apocalyptic world? Uh, maybe that's the only toy available for kids. <laughs> I don't know. That. But it, you don't see them sell it. You just no, see them make it all make throughout it. the entire movie. Right. And then kind of test them. Yeah, we don't see anybody leave the building except but they to go probably, in the sewers. And so that's why, like, the questions are in my head. They probably use the mailman as their way of selling them. I don't know. <laughs> right, maybe. But, I mean, that's their way into the outside world. Maybe they're too afraid to steer away from that building because something would happen to them, like, A, it turned into meat. Yeah, or I'm not saying you're like wrong these... about any of this stuff. I just wish the <laughs> movie told or, me more. Oh, uh, yeah. And then they're afraid of these sewer people, but it's like these sewer people just want to, like, help the other people <laughs> above yeah, ground. Well, they only want to help the people above ground because they're going to get paid in that stash of corn right. that the butcher is hoarding. Mm. Um, so, I mean... It seems like the people who are underground are also equally afraid of the service dwellers. Yeah, they're you know, afraid so. of each other, but yeah, I mean, but I don't, we don't know if we there's don't an know external why. threat to both of them or not. Right. We don't know. There's, there's like a... There's posters and whatnot, but we don't get to see anything other than... Because they're probably kind of like... I don't... We can get into like this whole thing where it's like the meat eaters versus the vegetarians or vegans or something. It's like some weird... You're either this or you're not. And then it's like the, um, whoever is broadcasting whatever's on TV is probably like putting fear into the quote meat eaters and saying, you know, beware of the vegetarians. I don't know. <laughs> then they're called, they're the troglodytes and they all live underground because I don't know if they come back up into the world they were probably afraid of being sacrificed to be served as meat. I don't know. Right, and that's the that's my <laughs> whole point is you don't know, and like you're making assumptions of what's being broadcast on TV that's instead of I'm the just... movie showing us what right. could, you know okay. what I mean. That's what that's what I'm saying. Like we have to create these scenarios in our head to fill in the gaps that the movie left, and that's one of my major problems with it. <laughs> um. I, I guess it's just, like, ambiguous and just, like, up to us to not figure it out, but to just be like, this is how it is. Yeah, I just wish it wasn't that way. Mm. I, I mean, I, I, this... It doesn't have to go full bore on it, but, I mean, you know, give us a little bit more. I want a little bit more context. Build the world a little bit. You I have mean, the I, time to do so. I was kind of... I was fine with it once I got it. And, I mean, this atmosphere also, I know you haven't seen this movie, but it's similar to, like, Eraserhead, mm. where it seems like it is a post-apocalyptic world. And it's, like, that same, like, grain. It's all, like, foggy. Even though, like, Eraserhead's black and white, but you can tell it's all foggy, and then it's, like, very industrial, and it's, like, yeah, it either you very... work here, and then you live here. You work, live, work, live. And then yeah. that's all they show. They don't show, like, why they're there or why they're doing anything. 
Yeah, the 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 world itself, when they see any sort of external shots, is very orange, very brown. I mean, the, yeah. the internal shots are also that way, but there's more like reds and greens in there too. Um, and it, yeah, the city has something of a minor steampunk vibe. Yeah. To it, uh, it's probably yeah just that industrial side of things, and yeah, the haze of the the orange and the industrial waste or whatever is clogging up the air or whatever so um but that goes away near the end like you know we do get to see some blue in the sky at the end for the quote-unquote happy ending yeah. <laughs> as happy of an ending as he could possibly be and i think that would have helped the ending too to understand like what kind of other threats they still have to face even though whatever threat that happened in the building is gone like that you know i don't know it, it would have provided more context to the ending too um but yeah, visually this movie um, is great. You know, you have the yeah. you have the, the the muted color palette, which works for what you're working with. Um, it's very Terry Gilliam like to me. Yeah, uh, a lot of fisheye lens or you know like mild fisheye lens uh, camera work. A lot of tilted cameras. So you get like diagonal shots and stuff like that and. Um, I think filling that's, the frame with visual interest virtually at all times. I think when this movie was, from what I read about this movie, it was when it was presented to the United States. It was presented by Terry Gilliam. Oh, okay. when it was released in North America. So he, yeah, he, so he probably um, he probably saw it, it and was like, "I'm gonna present this to the Americas." That's not, yeah, that makes sense. That that works. Um, but I, I would not be surprised if Junet uh, had Gilliam as a, as a major influence to oh, yeah. his, his work there. Um, and again, that's not a bad thing. You know, I, I like that level of creativity. Uh, I like how he played with the... There wasn't a whole lot of sound in it, but when there was, like, diegetic music from, you know, playing on the TV, like the Hawaiian song or whatever else, you know, they they played with the rhythm of the songs that appeared mm -hmm. with the visuals in the show. So, like, you know, he's trying to fix the, the squeaky bed while that Hawaiian song is playing, and yeah. he's doing it in rhythm, and they're bouncing on the bed to find out what spring it is on the rhythm. And right. There's, like, a couple sequences like that, too, where, you know, everyone's just kind of, like in sync with each other and right uh that's Within that's really that fun to watch too i think it also sort of has a vibe of like a 90s alternative video if you want to uh, yeah if you're like not if someone minutes. listening is, yeah <laughs> yeah if someone listening is not too familiar with terry gilliam's work for what you know uh if you were alive in the 90s and saw alternative videos it does have that sort of feel uh, a lot of grittiness a lot of you know everything is sort of run down and dirty as well um the frequent cuttings the playing with the speed of the camera to match the the music that's behind whatever's happening sometimes and stuff like that it definitely had a very 90s feel to me it started the trend maybe i don't know maybe a lot of uh video directors you know the nine inch nails directors and you know oh like that the graininess future. yeah, yeah. The, maybe, maybe they took advantage uh, uh, inspiration from this one thing that, you know, you kind of learn as we go along is that Louisan uh, used to be a clown in his previous life. And now he's working as a handyman in this building. Um, and we kind of get that revelation. I don't know if it's really a revelation, but we get that plot point maybe about like halfway through. But before that happens, uh, we see him like playing with bubbles, and you know he's yeah. We don't know that he's a clown and stuff like we that. We don't know he's a clown until he reveals that he's a clown to yeah. Julie. And it's not really like a hidden plot point, it's right? Not like you a just revelation see... in terms of you know when oh he my moves gosh, into... this changes everything. Yeah, when he moves into the building, you see him take all the stuff out of his trunk. The, the cab, yeah, yeah. And you see his shoes, and you can tell that they're kind of clowny. And then he takes all these, like, stuff out of his trunk, and it's like, you know, clapping monkeys and stuff like that. Yeah, he's like a so mechanical like, monkey thing. So you can be like, oh, okay. You can 
put two and two together. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if you're paying more attention than I did. Uh, oh, okay. You know, yes, <laughs> you could definitely put two and two together. Um, like, oh, this guy was a clown or is or whatever. But yeah, but get it's. It. It's like, I don't know if he was a clown. See, I don't, this is, I know we're, things weren't explained, but it was like, he stops being a clown because his, quote, partner, which Mm -hmm. was a monkey, Mm -hmm. was eaten. Yes. So, but he was also on TV a lot, because, you know, they show the people in the apartment building watching him perform a show at some casino at some time yeah but we don't like i don't know how many years ago that was like what was it like a month ago or what like 10 years ago what but i don't know i mean he basically just says you know i stopped being a clown when my partner was eaten right and at that time we don't know it was a monkey yeah we don't know it's a monkey and then he tells I mean, he becomes, like, very close with the butcher's daughter, Julie, kind of early on. Which and is also kind of a reveal later on that, that she's the father-daughter daughter daughter yeah. relationship, yeah. Because they don't really have a father-daughter relationship, like, at all. No. Yeah, the she's only the only time that you like get any there. sort of insinuation <laughs> is when, like, the, the postman is... Trying to like basically, hit on yeah, her. like sexually assaulting her in a, in a sense, and and the butcher's like, no, she's mine. Yeah, but, I mean that could be like a bad subtitle translation, but that's what it said yeah, on the screen. It's like, no, like, this no, girl's mine. She's my daughter. But yeah, she doesn't. It doesn't say daughter at the time. It yeah. just says mine. And we already know that the butcher will sleep with other tenants as their rent payment. So you kind of like I don't. know, The impression I got was okay. He's just he's just taking all these women is like a harem ah and later on it's like oh well that's 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 his daughter that's what he meant by she's She's mine mine, yeah it wasn't clear from the subtitles and again i don't know if that's a translation thing or if that's just like it's meant purposeful reveal later on i don't know but it just seems like i mean there's the other women in the building is you know the mother of the uh two children that are in that building the tapioca mom i guess yeah. they, they don't really say and, their and, first names it's and like the mr. grandma in that family yeah it's like mr and mrs tapioca and then the her mother the grandma and then uh-huh. you have the uh, yeah interlocutor aurora aurora, aurora. yeah um and i then, mean yeah and we then should, there's uh, yeah, yeah miss, we, miss plus miss plus plus Sorry. Mademoiselle Plus, I'm going to butcher is, uh, the French name, which is obviously no the butcher's, intended. yeah, which is obviously um, the butcher's girlfriend. Yeah, basically. I mean, <laughs> I mean it's just out of necessity. She looks, almost, yeah, she seems. looks young, so she cannot be Julie's mom. We don't know anything no, no. about like Julie's. No, we don't. Origin. I don't know. We're mom, I guess. Yeah, we just know that the butcher and the daughter have separate apartments in the same building. Um, and they keep they don't really because the daughter doesn't yeah, really like her father. Yeah, she they just like she just probably stays there for free because that's her father's building. Mm-hmm. And she just, I mean, you see her go, coming and going, but I don't. We yeah, we don't know where anyone goes. That's part of the issue. I mean, we see. She plays. She plays uh, the bass. Yeah, is it the bass? Or yeah. Um, and then he plays the musical saw. Yeah. And they have like a, a nice duet. And that's, yeah, one of the reasons I wanted to bring that up is, you know, I was impressed with the skills that Dominique Pinone learned for this. I mean, you know. I shouldn't like, say like bass, but cello. He plays the saw, and there's like a cute part where they play together her cello and his saw. And it's, like, obvious that they have, like, this crush on each other. Yeah. Like, immediately. Kind of immediately, because she, um, she gets sent the beans in the mail. It was, like, cookies or something. It was, some, oh. it was like, a special thing. Um, yeah, it wasn't beans. It was, it was like, cookies or the, the breads that, he, that she was making for him at okay. the tea party thing. And they try to do. Yeah, okay. Because she gets... I mean, we still don't know the answers, but the 
I don't know if it's because the mailman just has a crush on her or just really wants her. And he's always delivering these packages to her and it's food, like beans or those cookies or whatever. And then the other people in the apartment building are like starving. Mm -hmm. So whenever they see the mailman deliver something to her, they want to like tackle down the mailman and take whatever he's delivering. Yeah, like the kids are able to steal the package away and like run away. And yeah. Then, um, yeah. Uh, Louis Song is able to get it away from the kids and then the postman comes after him thinking he's trying to steal the package as right. well. But and, he's and just... that's when Julie comes to his defense and is like, no, that's my friend. Yeah. Yeah, and then that's when she's like, why don't you come over for dinner? And the postman has a gun and everything too. Like, like that. So I mean, that's like another like illusion as to what's going on because like it's a postman who has a gun and he's like threatening the kids, threatening to shoot the kids. He's probably. For stealing the I mean, there's probably like, like beggars and whatever the hell out. I mean, I know. It's I'm like it's probably a very dangerous world, but right. we don't know. We enough don't see about how it is <laughs> outside not... besides what's in this building. Yeah, just... it's probably like nine thousand times worse. Out. Yeah, most likely. I just would have wanted to see it more. I'm sorry. Yeah. Retreading the same points over and over again. <laughs> um, but yeah, so yeah, she's like, oh, as a thanks, let me invite you over to have some of this with me. And and for some reason, like, okay, so she's wearing glasses um, most of the time, but she decides to take them off for the for party, them? I guess, to try to maybe make herself like, look, look more desir- attractive yeah, or desirable. I don't know. Um, but she's like, and obviously later, hard. Later she says she has contacts at a different scene. And I don't know if she's lying or if she did a, acquire contacts afterwards in an un, you know unseen package. Yeah, but I don't know. Um, because it's obvious in when they first meet up at her place that she can't see cuz she's, you know, pouring tea and it's And she's like, yeah, measuring out the steps like okay, if I yeah, yeah, yeah. One, two, three, here's this. One, because she can't see anything. Right. And so, yeah, you see her, like, try to and measure it out. And she even says that she has two of everything because yeah, she because knocks she down stuff. a vase. And then she's like, I have two of everything. And then she, like, replaces the vase. Yeah, it's a very cute and charming scene. But it would probably be know, a little bit it's better in a different... Funny. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, it'd be a better scene, like, maybe in a different movie, but, I mean, like, it still works in this one, but I think, yeah. yeah. If it was in, like, a straight comedy, it would be, uh, maybe, like, a little bit better fit. Um, so, yeah, like, she's bumping into things, and it's very good physical comedy from both of them. Mm-hmm. You know, her trying to pour the tea and being completely oblivious, and he's, like, trying to switch cups and, you know, right. do all this other or stuff. She's, or... Yeah, he's moving... She's moving the tea pot around and he's following her yeah. with the cup yeah yeah it's I really mean, fun cute and then i mean he just becomes uh he's kind of just charming everyone in the building like even the kids you know with the doing the whole bubble thing mm-hmm. and then he's kind of becoming friendly with the girlfriend uh Mad- mademoiselle plus of the butcher yeah yeah because helping, she's, helping fix the bed and then um she's doing she's the like dance hey do it yeah you know she's she was probably a dancer at some point because yeah he helps her with a dance but then you know yeah, he shows her the uh the, the tika tika walk act where he has right. like three legs and he's you know like switching yeah like one of them's fake and then yeah he's like switching them out and stuff like that it's like a fun little routine as well so so many skills that he learned in this. Right. You know? <laughs> like learning how to like blow to bubbles and put like clown. smoky bubbles yeah. within a bubble and right. playing a musical saw and stuff. It's very impressive to me. All the different stuff that he did in this. Yeah, so I mean he's becoming friendly with all of these tenants, but they all know that he's supposed to be their food (laughs) i don't know i mean they all everyone in the building knows that whoever is the uh fixer upper guy is gonna get killed at some point yeah to be their meat that seems to be the overall goal yeah so i i again i don't know when they decide to make that choice normally but it's because he's getting close to the daughter that the butcher wants to do it like now right um and i i feel like 
the daughter, I mean, everyone knows this, but I think the daughter automatically wanted to become friends with him because I think she was probably friends with the guy that was the previous fixer upper guy because she uh when they first meet and he's talking about him being a clown he talks about how his partner was eaten and she's like oh she's like oh that something like that happens here like she's warning him like this is what we're gonna do to you yeah like this is what this building is about yeah that there's like rules and yes Trying she's to trying to that. warn him, but he's kind of like, oh, no, my partner was a monkey, whatever. Yeah, like, don't go on the stairs at night. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, each there's, like, a bunch of different side stories that are happening here, and most of them come together at the end in some form or fashion. So you have the tapiocas who are really hard on their luck. They have the two kids, and, like, you know, they have virtually no money. You see the dad, like repairing his condom to be used yeah. over and over again like yeah one of the little things is like you see like two gone. patches in it and they yeah. have two kids and so you know it broke twice and that's why you know that's you know, the insinuation there right um and they have the the grandmother you have the yeah aurore and uh her husband jean francois i think yeah uh, oh that's the actor's name sorry george is the the character name and he, i mean we she's just kind of like uh i mean we get and we can probably do a trigger warning because it is suicide mm-hmm. she tries so many ways to kill herself because she thinks she's hearing voices in she's her hearing head. voices in her head but she's kind of like this anxious woman that seems to never leave the house and her husband is he goes out and works i'm assuming because he just I guess comes so, and, yeah he comes and goes yeah and then he's when he comes back because he he's dressed up nicely right but he's still not making much money or whatever because when you know the julie says oh this is a coffee grinder he's like oh it must be really nice to be rich right so like he's yeah still he looks like he's doing really well for himself right because he looks like he's in a up, business but, suit yeah and even Aurora dresses very nicely. You know, she's got, like, pearls and, mm-hmm. like, very nice dresses. But, yeah, I mean, they, their whole storyline is just her hearing voices. And she just, and then her husband comes home. She tells him about the voices, and he's kind of like, whatever about it. He's well, like, Well, yeah, oh. he's also that way about her suicide attempts, too. So, like, she sets up all these, like fancy rube goldberg type you know things so that like when someone comes over and rings the doorbell it's going to shake this thing which will make the lamp fall into the tub right you know it's like this other or someone's not going to open the door then it's going to make the gun go off or whatever right she's always making like she just doesn't sort of like indirectly killing herself is yeah she doesn't want to do it herself and every, time, and every time it fails, yeah, the husband is like, oh, you type of a Yeah, but look. she's still talking about these voices, and he's like, mm, whatever. Like, yeah. he doesn't, doesn't really care. console her in any way. No. He just comes and goes to work, and she's just at home the entire time going nuts because she hears voices in her head. And, right. But then we find out at the close to the end... That it's like the neighbors, who, the guys that are making those cow toys, yeah, like fucking with her. Yeah, one has like a crush or affair with her, and the other one's like jealous of it or wants it to stop, and so yeah. she's talking through the pipes to get her to stop. Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, Sylvia Laguna is the name of Aurora. Um, very, very expressive face. Yeah. And, you know, really perfect casting for that, I think. Um. And then you have the Frogman. Yeah, he just... Which I do not understand his purpose other than to be another in the, quirky thing yeah, to be in the movie. He's just like another quirky character in this. And he just lives in their basement and it's like constantly flooded. And he's got... Like purposefully. Yeah, like yeah. He, he, keeps, yeah, he keeps water on the floor so his frogs can live thrive and yeah snails everywhere that he eats to a degree and then also they're just everywhere for the i guess maybe the frogs also i don't know if right. the frogs also know. eat the snails i have no idea but so there's like yeah a pile of snail shells 
and you see like snails on the records and all over the place like barnacles on the apartment and frogs are hopping around but it doesn't i don't think he factors into the plot like at all he's just there to be as another quirky person in this building i guess i guess so and then the two kids they kind of mess with him but he's he like shoes them off a lot yeah. Because they're always trying to take his frogs. Yeah, they want they want the frogs to eat and he, he He's like, No, you can't take my frog Yeah. But he he seems to be blind maybe because he's always just sitting in this rocking chair type thing, listening to loud marching band music all day. And he's got these sunglasses on, but I don't know if that's Yeah, I don't know if it's just a quirk a with thing. the goggles or what I don't yeah. yeah, I don't know. But that's him. But he <laughs> But exists. he doesn't... I don't he, think yeah, he cares the movie, about but... the meat or anything. No, I don't think so, because he has the snails. That's his own meat. Yeah. So he lives off his snails, basically. But... And um, the... The butcher guy doesn't seem to mess with him either. He's just there. Mm-hmm. But yeah, again, I just don't know the purpose of it. And I really don't know the purpose of the cow toy people either, except to... Have to the be the, part the, of the Aurora, Aurora stuff. Plotline, yeah. They don't really matter aside from. They're just that. making. Yeah, because they're just. I don't. They're two guys that live together. Are they like brothers? I mean, they don't I really don't say know. anything. Yeah, I don't know if they are or not. It's. Their the character names are Robert and Roger. Yeah. But uh, there aren't last names for both of them, so I don't know for right. sure. Right. Um, but I mean, at least like the Aurora plotline pays off as part of the ending. Mm-hmm. The, so I mean, I guess if you want to talk about it as a roundabout way to get her to you know have these suicidal tendencies, you need to have at least one of those characters or both of them or whatever. But I mean, you don't necessarily need to have them. She could just be suicidal in general and have these devices. Yeah, because of what's and, going on in the world. Yeah. Not just because she's hearing voices all day long. Exactly. So, there's unnecessary characters, I guess. I think it's just, you know, another quirky thing to add. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, like I said at the very beginning, like, quirkiness for quirkiness sake. Hmm. But those cow people were not super quirky in and of themselves. It's just, oh, unrequited love. And right. Guy. You know, <laughs> co-worker I mean, of Whenever they love. showed these cutesy little uh, parts with the, um, you know, like with the bed squeaking and then they do all these, it's kind of like the whole building come to, coming together, making their own sounds Right. when yeah, that bed squeaks. They're participating in the music in a sense. Like they, they do their own little cow noise thing and then you have like Miss Tapioca beating on her carpet at the same time the same mm-hmm. beat and then you know you've got the bed squeaking cow noise carpet yeah. bang bed squeak carpet or whatever yeah it's like going and the painting rolling yeah, brush and stuff like it's that it's like yeah. going back and forth for a few minutes yeah so it's to add add a little bit of flavor to the overall experience but it's um didn't it didn't produce the substance so again that's sort of what i come back to and this is like yeah visually dynamic really interesting to watch but just not as much substance as i would have liked to see um i think the whole thing with the troglodytes as well maybe went on a bit too long with like the rescue sequence or even this stuff that was uh, I mean, setting up the rescue mission yeah uh, i mean because julie yeah. wants to save louis Song. And so, yeah, she She goes to the troglodytes to ask him to help. To yeah. So there's multiple scenes, and they kind of go on a little long. It's it's a unique setting, at least. You know, it is something that isn't the apartment building. I mean, yeah, it's just more quirkiness, because then they all introduce themselves to her, and they all have, like, interesting names. Like, Fox. I can't remember, like, all the other guys' yeah. names. <laughs> Fox, I think, is played by Mark Caro, yeah, specifically, yeah. right? Um, and they all have kind of like one word names yeah they have like i don't know if they're supposed to be code names but yeah maybe. at this point in the world but um comes across that way and they they all i mean i thought they were all just you know charming in their own way trying to you know save louis yeah and they almost act like they don't know how humanity works because there's that like 
weird conversation when they um, accidentally kidnap Miss Plus. Yeah. And they're like questioning if she's male or female. Right. Because they don't, like, as it, if they aren't also human and couldn't right. tell the difference. Yeah, Julia's like, uh, cap- here's his apartment. Capture, he's a man and he has clown shoes. Like, right. those are the only clues yeah. that are given to it's these like, well, This person was in the apartment, so it must be him. Right. Yeah. And then, are is this person wearing clown shoes? Is this person a man? And they're like, I don't know. Let's figure out if this person is a man. And she's like, swearing at them, basically. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like, don't you idiots know that I'm a woman? Right. And they're like, oh, let's look at her shoes, because, you know, Julie said clown shoes, also a man, but, I don't know, I thought that was funny. Yeah, it's a good funny sequence. <laughs> you know, the troglodytes tried to save Louison, they accidentally get Mademoiselle Plus, and, um, I mean, at this point, it's kind of like... All the tenants are like, let's just get... They're all, like, now on the butcher side and they're like let's get Louis Song because we're hungry <laughs> I don't know cause even she like um Mademoiselle Plus even kind of turns on him because this is another thing like earlier on when the little boys are messing around they, it's just the little boys are just messing with every all the attendants in the building cause you know they're bored and they're kids uh-huh. And so, like, this one part where they take Mademoiselle Plus's, like, underwear. Yeah. And it kind of flings across on some light hook thing. Yeah, the kids throw it. Yeah, they throw it out the window. They throw it out the window, like, across the street. And it's on this light hook post thing. And then Louisan is like, I have what is called The the Australian. And it's, like, this boomerang knife thing. So he, like, throws this boomerang knife thing, cuts down her underwear, it falls to the ground, and then the knife thing comes back. And, like, at the end of the movie, he loses... Well, I mean, he, these people, all these tenants are coming after Louisan, and he's in the apartment building with Julie, and they end up in the bathroom, and he's flooding the bathroom so that when these people open that door, they, this wall of water (laughs) just like pushes them all the way down, out, down the stairs, like almost out the building. Yeah. Like almost killing these people. I don't know. Cause it's like this big torrential thing (laughs) coming down like a huge wave. Yeah. And in the middle of that, he loses the Australian, but then you see like Mademoiselle, Plus, give he she finds it and gives it to the butcher. She's like, here, use this. But it's like, oh, they were like friends. Unless she knew that it wouldn't hit him. And she knew that the thing would come back. Right before it hits him. I don't know if that's because I thought I, they I, were I, I actually want... friendly with each other. But then I don't know that her boyfriend is the butcher and they're hungry, so I don't right. know. They're like, let's just eat this person. Yeah, I don't know. It could go both ways, probably. I'd have to I'd have to watch the scene again and see like what her face looks like at the time. I think she was surprised <laughs> that that it came back and yeah, it came butcher. back and killed him. Yeah, maybe. Um, you're probably right. Um, so yeah, because she seems a little like pissed at this point. I think she's pissed that she got oh, kidnapped yeah, she, by the yeah, troglodytes. She's mad that she got kidnapped because of him. And, and she's like, I don't give a shit anymore. Here, here, I found his knife. Yep. Use this. And then, you and know. The apartment building is obviously getting flooded and falling, a, and falling it's, apart. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of. A lot happens at the end. It, it becomes yeah. a very crazy adventure at the end, which is fine. That's not a bad thing. Right. It, it works well in the context of the movie, too. Like, everything. Um, Everything makes sense. Yeah. Uh, which is odd to say about a movie <laughs> like this, but um, yeah, it, it all makes sense in that in that context. So it it gets crazy, and then it, it nice little uh, 
coda at the end where they're on the roof with the blue skies and playing their duet again. So Yeah, on top of this building that's like halfway collapsed. Yeah. And it's just, you know, all the rest yeah. of the tenants, like the I think the tapiocas and Julie and Louison, they're all on the roof. And, you know, Julie and Louison are playing their instruments and everyone's just happy again. Yeah, which is weird because, again, uh, like half of the apartment has been destroyed, at least. Right. Um, but we don't know. I mean, we don't know what's going to... I mean, are they going to live... What? How are they going to live off of? Are they going to be like the troglodytes and be vegetarians because you don't have the butcher anymore? Right. Yeah, so, yeah, you have, like, one, one problem is solved, but we, again... That's what I'm saying, like, the ending might be a little bit better if they could have explained more about the world to know how safe are they now. I think they're just happy because... Is there a path forward for them? I mean, they fall in... It's a cute love story, and all that matters is that they're in love and they're happy. (laughs) Yeah, that's... that's, that's She saved his life, and no one really cares what's going to happen food-wise until... I don't know. I mean, it could... Like, if there was, like, a sequel, it would be, like, all of them turning on each other again because they're all hungry. Could be. (laughs) But we probably won't see that sequel. I don't, it's I don't fine. know if that's going to happen at all. It's just, you know, I like the way it ended. Yeah. You know, I'm kind of curious about um, how this, you know, if there was this much thought put into the screenplay. Because uh, what I read was that Junet wanted to do City of Lost Children first, mm. but couldn't because it was too ambitious, too much of a budget. Um, and so this movie was sort of pitched as an alternative or, you know, was done first to give him the, you know, the attention, the pedigree, the, the experience to allow him to do something more. Like he knew like that he children. was going to do a good job for a city of lost children. Like, like that, that was his comp- baby. Yeah. yeah like he that was like, was his... I know this is a good film yes. and I want it to be the best that it can be. Yeah. And so, so this was created as like a lower budget alternative to be um, like, here's an introduction to, to, to me the movie that he really wanted yeah. to do. Uh, so I don't know if maybe some of the things that I'm personally complaining about are, you know, as a result of, I don't know how rushed this was, you know, if he got those rejections for City of mm. Lost Children. And he's like, I got to put something together quickly to, you know, allow me I to I mean, what he did quickly is, you know, career. amazing. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it still is very much worthwhile, mm-hmm. but just had some downsides to me personally. Um, so, yeah, it was interesting to see how that... I, I do want to revisit City of Lost Children now just yeah. to, to understand that. Um, I've seen Amelie like three or four different times. So, I mean, that that's his biggest success i think mm-hmm. uh, and much more of a cohesive with the cordiness and all i think it says a lot when the actors follow directors from movie yeah. to movie to movie and also when the directors will continue to cast the same actors from mm-hmm. project to project that they build that that kismet um and virtually all of the actors that we see in this are in um his other movies yeah so Alien Resurrection, though, I wonder. <laughs> Did someone ask him, like, hey, I, I mean, now I'm curious and I kind of want to watch Alien Resurrection. I mean, we saw that with, yeah. Alfonso. Yeah, so we saw this with Alfonso Coron as well, where he had started and then was offered American gigs because of the hits I mean, yeah, of he did, like, movies. So Harry I think Potter. Was, yeah. But, and, I mean, you can Jeanette tell. was also offered a Harry Potter. Oh, that's interesting. But he said he declined because most of the creative decisions were already made before he would have been able to sign oh. on. And so he's like, I can't add anything to this. I can't, you know, put my personal touch onto it, so mm. forget it. Well, and so I mean, maybe that's what he experienced with the Alien Resurrection. He's like, okay, I need to do my own projects. I'm not doing this Hollywood stuff anymore. Oh, so maybe he was like, they asked him to do American movies, and yeah. he chose, or I don't know, they were like, do this. But he was like, I'm not happy because I wasn't able to be me. Probably. But, I mean, with Alfonso Cuaron's his Harry Potter, like the third movie, Prisoner of Azkaban, I can tell that that's Alfonso Cuaron. Yeah, I mean, there's there's things that you can do, but I mean... Like, um, I can tell certain parts in that movie. I'm like, 
this is like his vision. I don't want to say his vision because it's like the Harry Potter world, but right. But he he used his like little elements. Yeah. For and, that mo- type of movie. And so yeah, maybe Jeanne is just. I think he was offered Order of the Phoenix, if I remember reading that right. Okay. Um. So you know maybe he just thought I couldn't add enough. I couldn't you know. I mean, Order of the Phoenix gets a little like depressing oh i mean we get to that's yeah. this is harry that's potter talk other, that's a whole other podcast probably. so he probably like i don't know because that i think that's the part where like harry had to like write into his own skin and that's whatever there's no like quirkiness that can be done in that movie yeah that might I'm, have been his and he's like i don't want to do that right he could have done like the fourth one but um, i know they probably have they people might have offered it to him. yeah all right <laughs> So he's he instead he did stuff like a very long engagement and like Mick Max a couple of years back or oh my god almost a decade back now that, that, that that's what he's been doing since is continuing to do his own things. Um, I mean I'd rather him do his own thing because I I like this like sense of humor quirkiness. Yeah, absolutely. Hopefully we'll see more of his stuff come over across the seas because I don't think it all does. Um, but I liked it, obviously. But I do. I mean, looking at his credits, he has a movie that's supposed to be coming out for. It says it scheduled to be released this in twenty twenty one on Netflix. It's called Big Bug. Okay. And it has Dominique Pinon. Yeah, it has in Pinon. It. Pinon's in everything, including yeah. Alien Resurrection. He's in that too. Oh. So he's been in absolutely everything. A couple other cast members I do want to mention really quickly here is uh, Jean Claude Dreyfus. Dreyfus, did mm-hmm. we land on that? Who played the butcher? Um, he was. He had a little bit of American crossover. Most of these actor actors and actresses stayed in France and and worked there. So I don't know much about that world of cinema. And and you know, unless there's like a crossover appeal, I didn't see a whole lot that came over to the states. Um, but Dreyfus was in uh, Cheech and Chong's The Corsican Brothers. Okay, <laughs> and he was also in the Adventures of Pinocchio, starring uh, Jonathan Taylor Thomas's voice uh, oh. that, that we watched like a couple uh, okay. years back. <laughs> um, uh, like as who though? <laughs> he was like a foreman. He oh, had a small part, right. but still, he was in there. So he's. I mean that I can understand because that area. I mean that atmosphere is very. I don't know. I don't want to say French, but just European. Yeah, maybe they shot it in France. I don't know. Um, but he also has like you know he has a very expressive face he has a very you know yeah camera friendly face um so uh, a couple other people i want to talk about really quickly and then we can move on to awards talk uh darius kanji was the cinematographer uh he is oscar nominated for his work on evita uh he was caesar nominated so it's like the french film awards that you know the most prestigious french film awards he was nominated for city of lost children and amour uh, so hmm. he, he did the cinematography for that independent spirit nomination for the immigrant and midnight in paris and he's also worked with david fincher on panic room in seven so he's he's been around and, and does a lot of a lot of uh, solid work just like he did in this one uh, but my big pausing on the credits for this episode is Howard Vernon, who played the Frogman. Okay. Uh, he has been in quite a few French films. I think he primarily lives in France. He was, uh, I believe, Swiss origin, born in Switzerland. Okay. Um, so he was in things like Bob Le Flambeur. But he really cut his teeth on a lot of uh, exploitation horror type movies. So he's been in stuff like A Thousand Eyes of Dr. Mabuse. The, he was the lead character. He was Dr. Orloff in those movies, like the awful Dr. Orloff. Um, he's played uh, characters in a couple of the older Zorro movies from the 1950s and 60s. Um, he's in stuff like... He's played Dracula before, uh, including in a movie called Dracula, Prisoner of Frankenstein, which sounds really interesting to me. Mm. <laughs> he's, uh, again, like sort of like these exploration movies, Erotic Rites of Frankenstein, Virgin Among the Living Dead, um, and... and Things with titles along those, you know, definitely meant to sort of titillate the senses is, is what he had really been heavily involved in. And he also uh, played Nazis in a lot of movies as well, such as uh, playing Dr. Mengele in Angel of Death. Um, so he has a long storied career 
and this was near the tail end of it because he passed away in 1996 at 88 years old. So, a key figure in the uh, the cult and horror movie uh, genre of the 50s and 60s. On to awards talk. There were a few for this one. Most of them came from the, the Caesar Awards. Uh, but it was also BAFTA nominated for the best non-English film. Uh, I didn't actually look up the winner. This released in most of the world in 1992, and so uh, the winner would not be part of our podcast, most likely. And so I didn't bother to look it up. I probably should have. Uh, on the Caesar Award side of things, it won several of them. It won the best first work for Caro and Jeunet. It won best screenplay. It won production design. It won the editing award. Uh, and then it was nominated for several more, uh, supporting actor for Dreyfus, uh, the butcher, but uh, he lost to uh, Jean Carme for Merci La Vie. Uh, promising actress for uh, Marie Laure Dunyoc. Dunyoc? You kind of did it the first time. Okay. <laughs> like I said, I'm not Dunyac. good with Dunyoc. Uh, who played Julie. Um, she lost to Geraldine Filehaus for a movie called Snow and Fire, which I'm not very familiar with. And then uh, it, lo- uh, it was nominated for Best Music, Best Cinematography and costume design and sound, but all of those awards went to All the Mornings of the World, wow. which we've already covered. I mean, the the cinematography in All the Mornings of the World still, like, blows my mind to this day. <laughs> yeah. Even though we watched it a couple months ago, I mean... Yeah, I really can't argue any of those. <laughs> I mean, yeah, the cinematography in this is also really good. It's good, but, but like... All the Mornings, all the mornings of the world, world is a big surprise at how solid and painterly it is and that, also i mean I, it makes sense i mean music, i hope that movie is like designs. taught in schools or something <laughs> <laughs> like two future cinematographers sure um so that's that's the award side of of things uh on to true crime of pop culture we go i think uh okay so this movie was released on april 17th 1991 which was a wednesday I and... think the only other Wednesday we've had was All the Mornings of the World. Huh, okay, yeah. So, um, I couldn't find anything. I mean, nothing's going to be <laughs> related to this. <laughs> oh, true crime-wise? True cri- crime-wise. No. I didn't see anything. Future true crime, maybe, but not current. Uh, yeah, I mean, you don't know what's going to happen. I, I mean, turn it. I mean, we. Sh- I was thinking we should have watched this movie first like this should have been the first of the food month yeah because it's kind of like on the verge of like going from horror into food i don't know yeah we probably should have (laughs) we went for the heavy hitter with fried green tomatoes yeah we were like let's start with a family fun movie we should have ended we've had a couple of like stinker direct video ish type things let's go for a heavy hitter with fried green tomatoes i mean this is this is sort of heavy heavy hitter ish true but, but not, never, not number 11 I mean, in the box office. Right, I mean, this I is know. number 154. Because I was thinking, like, we should... Because, I mean, dealing with... I mean, it's... They don't show pe- the people getting chopped up or eaten, but it's implied that they're eating people. Yeah, they, I mean, there's a little bit of blood and gore. Yeah. Just the tiniest bit, but yes. You're right. But, uh, but yeah, pr- I couldn't find... Are, there probably are true crime stories of butchers doing humans. Maybe. Yeah. That, you probably have to do some hunting for that, though. The, nothing that inspired this movie to, like... The reason I looked up, like, the reason why Jean-Pierre made this, and it was pretty much like what you said, how he had to come up with something real quick. Yeah. But a couple of the, like, trivia that I found about is that um, he got the idea for this movie when he vacationed in America... And he said after staying in America's hotels, he felt that the food was so bad that it tasted like real humans. Okay. And I was like, oh, okay. (laughs) But, um, yeah, I couldn't find anything that relates this movie that was, like, true to life. I mean, there are probably 
people getting chopped up, but I don't want to talk about that. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> to, for two people getting chopped up to be served as food. So let's talk pop culture then. Yeah, and also I couldn't find anything that happened on April 17th. Historical-wise. Yeah, news-wise around that time. Um, so going on to... I'll talk about music first. So the top five songs on the Hot 100 charts, the Billboard Hot 100, as of April 20th, 1991. So this was like a week before Talent for the Game. Talent for the Game was April 27th, I think. So the number one song is You're in Love by Wilson Phillips. Number two is Baby Baby by Amy Grant. Number three is I've Been Thinking About You by London Beat. Number four is Hold You Tight by Tara Kemp. And number five is Joyride by Roxette. And then Spar- Star Spangled Banner Watch. <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, it's number 33 on this chart. Okay. So it's up and down. Yeah, it's not bad. We I should- think... We need to like, create a full on timeline. Um, yeah, like, I don't think we should. Yeah, we gotta do like a timeline. So, like, if we do Whitney Houston, Star Spangled, Star Spangled Banner Watch, because I know it was, I think on the first week it was on, it was at 20 so far. Okay, that and, we've seen. And it's going down. That then, we've yeah. seen, yeah, yeah, so far. And we saw 99 on that one, but that was later That was like later. in May. Yeah. So, yeah. It's going up and down the charts. <laughs> and heading on down. And then TV-wise, on Wednesday, Wednesday nights, we have on ABC, The Wonder Years. Okay, yep. Yeah. Watched that a lot. Uh-huh. After that was Growing Pains. And then Doogie Hauser. And then we have an episode of Anything But Love. We talked about this before. So I don't know if the days change or maybe we talked about this for all the mornings of the world. We might have, yeah. Uh, but that's, you know, that show with Jamie Lee Curtis and Richard Lewis mm-hmm. where they're working at, like, this magazine in Chicago. I, I never watched it. Yeah, I, I know I've seen at least a couple episodes of it. And then after that was Gabriel's Fire, which... That's on random days, because I've seen Gabriel's Fire on all these lists. Okay. A lot. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Like it's, this is a new episode, so I don't know if they show new episodes Wednesdays, and then it's like repeats on other days. I don't know. Oh, I gotta look at it. Maybe, yeah, maybe they switched the day between seasons. so like in, They could have, yeah. You know, the tail end of the 1990-91 season, it was on Wednesdays, and then like move switched it to, to Fridays. Fridays, another day. Another yeah. Another season. And then this was interesting. On CBS was Toon Night. Okay. And they showed... I don't know if you watched this because I watched this. And I don't know if I watched this on TV because I remember watching this like on VHS. But it was Bugs Bunny Overture to Dis- to Disaster. And it was like a amalgamation of... I guess the musical stuff in the Bugs Bunny commercial, not commercial, cartoons. Right, and they probably had like sketches in between to sort of like. Yeah, but I remember this. I probably would. I mean, I would not be surprised if we have it recorded. They called it a TV movie, but it was only like a half hour of, you know, material. Hmm. And it had, you know, the classical one where the opera. Yeah, what's opera, Doc? Yeah. Uh huh. That was on it, and then it was this other, the Baton Bunny, which I'm not sure of. And then they had, like, Sylvester and, you know, like, Daffy Dog, Porky Pig. They had, like, each their own thing, I guess. Yeah, I mean, but I, I remember watching heavily this. into Looney Tunes, especially Me too. Bugs Bunny, and so... Um, but I feel like this was probably, like, on VHS... In they probably, Blockbuster, yeah. and I probably rented it and watched it a lot. Cause probably. That's what I, but I guess this aired on April 17th, 1991 on CBS. <laughs> and after that was Primetime Pets, which we talked about, which mm-hmm. the funniest pets probably. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. Our best pets in the world. And after that was Jake and the Fat Man. I never watched it. I never watched it. I think my parents it. did every once in a while, but I wouldn't have cared. Yeah, that I just remember 
that title, and I thought yeah. it was funny when I was yeah. young. And then on NBC was an episode, but it was a repeat of Unsolved Mysteries, and we couldn't find the actual episode. Yeah, we didn't so know we which one was repeated, so we, we didn't we couldn't watch anything. We could watch it for this episode. And after Unsolved Mysteries was Night Court, Dear John, and then Quantum Leap. So Wednesday nights. Strong lineup on yeah. all those channels. Yeah. Well, maybe, Wednesday nights yeah. in 91 had Jeez. a lot of good shows. So we'll go on to rankings and ratings. Uh, where on your one to five star scale would you put Telecatessen? I'm going to give this a four. Four? All right. So it's probably in the, the top ten overall so far for you. Yeah. Uh, on my zero to four star scale, I'm going to say it's a three out of a four. Again, I really needed more... Yeah, story, story cohesiveness and character meaningfulness to pump it up higher uh every movie is worth watching once would you watch this again yeah yeah i would too i mean the visual stuff i would want yeah i would over. totally want to see this in the theater because you know i only watched it in school or i i've seen this movie twice once in school and then the second time for this podcast yeah. so I, don't know, I would like to see this in a theater Makes sense. Yeah, I, I think it would be fun to, to watch it again like that, too. Um, but just on its own, yeah, just the visual side of things, it's yeah, nice yeah. To, to see. There's a lot to look at. So uh, if you out there want to watch Delicatissen, as of this recording in October 2021, it's available on Prime, digital rental, VHS, or DVD, as always, check your local listings. You can listen to us on all of your major podcasting platforms. Please remember to rate, review, subscribe, and tell your friends. It does help us out a lot. You can email us at 1991movierewind at gmail.com. Of course, you can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Letterboxd. Just search 1991 Movie Rewind or go to 1991movierewind.com for the full list of movies along with show notes. Whitney Houston Watch and more. Uh, next week, we're taking a week off from the podcast, so enjoy your Thanksgiving. And then we'll be back uh, the week after to watch American Tale, Five Old Goes West. That's available on Stars, Digital Rental, VHS, and DVD. We'll see you then. Thanks. Thanks.